Um, so thank you for the introduction. It's really nice to be here. So I, I presented in this um, speaker series um, like six years ago, and my talk then was about this study that we were just planning, hadn't even gotten, gotten it off the ground yet. It was all kind of just an idea in my head. Uh, so it's very nice to come back several years later and tell you about uh, both what we have done and what we are uh, still have uh, going on, what's still underway. Um, so the title is Air Pollution, Fetal Growth, and Early Childhood Development, an update from the uh, UGAR study. So um, I'm actually not going to tell you about UGAR right away. I'm going to do a couple of things first, and that's partly just because um, I didn't want to kind of jump into the air pollution stuff and the, and the research stuff, um, knowing that people are coming to this talk with lots of different backgrounds and interests. And so I'll, I'll give a very quick kind of a brief introduction to air pollution. Um, and then I want to tell you a little bit about what's just what we've learned, not from my studies or our studies, but from just air pollution research generally being conducted around the world. Because there have been some real uh, important advances in our understanding of that relationship over the last, say, 10 years or so. And then, and then in, uh, for the last you know, uh, half or so, then I'll tell you specifically about our results um, in UB. So here we go. So a brief introduction to air pollution. Um, so... Um, Basically, anytime you burn something, you're going to produce air pollution, right? And that's important because we burn a lot of things for a lot of different reasons, kind of in our, in our way of life. Um, so we burn things to produce electricity, for heat, for cooking, for transportation, and so on and so forth. But the key thing is that the, the characteristics of the pollution that you produce, as well as the quantity or the amount of pollution that you produce, depends very much on what fuel um, you're burning. So as those of you who spend a lot of time in UB know, coal is a very uh, polluting fuel. Um, and, and coal is really the key problem uh, in UB in terms of the air pollution issue. Um, so there are other sources of air pollution, but really combustion is, is, is the, in many, many places, is the dominant one. In most places, is the dominant one. So when we say air pollution, we could actually be talking about literally thousands of different compounds uh, in the air, um, both, both in the gas phase and in the, in the um, uh, particle phase. Um, but really, in, in most cases, when people study air pollution, when governments regulate air pollution, and when governments or, or researchers measure or monitor air pollution, they're usually focused on one, one or more of these five pollutants, maybe a few others that aren't on this list. But these are kind of the key pollutants that you would find anywhere you go in the world. You're going to find most of these at some um, concentration. The one I'm going to really only talk about today is particulate matter. That's not because the others are unimportant. Uh, they are important. Um, but uh, particulate matter has been studied the most, and it seems to be the best predictor of the health risk from kind of the typical urban air pollution mixture. So if you're going to measure one thing, if you're going to study one thing, particulate matter makes sense to be the one that you choose. Um, so with, par with particles, size is really important, right? We care about the small particles. So um, anyone who talks about particulate matter is like obligated to show this slide. I think I've seen this slide in every air pollution talk I've ever been to. This is meant to show or give you some perspective on how small the particles are that we're talking about. So this sort of string looking thing, sort of long skinny thing is meant to be sort of a typical, uh, the size of a typical piece of human hair. So the particles we're most interested in are PM2.5. So these are particles that have a diameter of less than two and a half micrometers, where a micrometer is one one millionth of a meter. So these are really, really small particles. So you imagine if you take a piece of your hair, you could stack like 20 of these particles or something side by side across the width of a piece of your hair. So these are the really small particles that we care about. Um, we're not so concerned, as concerned generally about the bigger particles. The reason we worry about the smaller particles is that they have the ability to make it down deeper into the gas exchange region of our lung where, where, where gases um, are exchanged with the bloodstream. And our body is not particularly good at defending itself when particles get down into that region of the lung. Up, up in your upper air, airway, your body's pretty good at handling it. Down in the lower airway, uh, we have a little bit more trouble. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about particulate matter concentrations. Um, and um, I, to, before I do that, I just want to give you a sense when I, when I talk about concentrations, uh, what I mean. So if we imagine we have a volume of air, right? So let's imagine we have a box of air that's one meter by one meter by one meter. So we have one cubic meter of air. Um, that air would have a bunch of particles in it, right? And they're not, the particles aren't all nice, beautiful little spheres, but let's just pretend they're little spheres. We don't care so much about all the particles in the air. So as I said before, PM 2.5 refer refers to particles with a diameter less than 2.5 micrometers. So there are a lot of particles in the air that we're actually not particularly concerned about uh, from the perspective of, of human health or public health. So we really only care about the smaller ones, right? So when I say there is a PM 2.5 concentration of whatever, what I'm referring to is the, is the mass of these small particles in a volume of air. So if we took all these little particles and we weighed them all and figured out what they weigh and we added up all those weights, let's say it's 12 micrograms. Well, we have 12 micrograms of, of PM 2.5 mass in a one cubic meter volume of air. So that gives us a PM 2.5 concentration of 12 micrograms per cubic meter. So that gives us information both on kind of the, the amount of these particles in the air, but it also tells us about the size because again, we're talking about PM 2.5. So I just wanna sort of throw that up there so you all kind of have a sense when I start talking about concentrations. So we all already have an intuitive sense of this. Even if you're not sort of thinking in, you know, units of micrograms per cubic meter, you already have a sense of PM 2.5 concentrations. And one of the reasons for that is that it turns out that the particles that um, are most closely linked with human health also very efficiently scatter light. So the particles that affect visibility are also the particles that affect our health. And that's sh uh, shown here with, with some kind of nice looking views um, uh, from a national park in the US. Um, and you can see that when the PM 2.5 is 7.6 micrograms per cubic meter, the view is, is quite clear. That would be like a typical concentration in Vancouver, BC, where, where I live. Uh, you know, you see at 12 micrograms, you're already seeing, that's not a very big jump in concentration, but you're already seeing the effect that it has on visibility. That still is not, in, in the global context, 12 micrograms per cubic meter is not particularly polluted. At 21.7 down here, we're really starting to get some, some, uh, some um, uh, uh, problems with the, with the view that we're able to see. And then down here, we have 65 micrograms per cubic meter, and you can see the visibility. So the long-term average concentration in UB depends a lot on where in UB you are. In the city center, it's in the neighborhood of maybe 80 micrograms per cubic meter, so higher than what's shown in this picture. If you go up to you know, the, the, the heart of the Gare District, it might be several hundred micrograms per cubic meter. Um, so you know, even within a city like UB, as, as those of you who live here probably know, there's a lot of spatial variation. But this just gives you some sense of what, that, what those numbers actually look like. Okay, so let's now jump back and look, uh, look globally. As you may or may not know, um, this is a really a global problem. UB, is, UB is, gets a lot of attention for its air pollution, a lot of negative attention for its air pollution, but in many ways UB is not at all unique. This is a, this is a serious global uh, problem. Um, most of the world's population lives, lives in a place with, where the air is clearly unsafe. Um, and we can use diff different definitions of what unsafe means, but one common definition is to use the World Health Organization's guideline concentration of 10 micrograms per cubic meter. By that definition, 95% of the world's population is breathing unhealthy air. Um, and a significant percentage of the world's population is even breathing uh, concentrations that meet a much less stringent um, uh, standard or guideline. The, the, from my perspective, the, the, this is discouraging. What's more discouraging is that, is that if you look sort of at the population weighted average, the problem is actually getting worse, not better. So, you know, I come from Canada where, where generally the air is very good and I get people either explicitly or kind of implicitly saying to me like, oh, you study air pollution. Why don't you go do something important with your life? Like we've, we've, we've fixed that problem, right? Well, we haven't fixed that problem. And in fact, in many places it's getting worse. So for example, over this about six year period from 2010 to 2016, the, the population weighted, meaning we weight the concentration based on where more people are, uh, the concentration actually increased by 18%. And that's partly because, that's, as, as the quote continues on to say, that's partly because concentrations are, are increasing in the most uh, populous parts of the world, right? Like India, for example. 
Okay, so that's just sort of a bit on the, on the context. So now I want to talk a little bit about kind of air pollution and health, particularly what we've learned over the last 10 or so years. You probably have a sense um, already that air pollution affects health, but I want to tell you a little bit about what kind of what we've learned in recent years. So this is a very busy graph um, that I would show like at a, at a research talk, so don't worry about the details here. The point of this figure is that we now have very good evidence based on work that lots of people have done over the past 10 or 15 or 20 years to suggest that the air, effects of air pollution are not at all localized to the lung. Right? You think about air pollution affecting the lung, right? You take a breath of air, the particles deposit in your lung. Well, that's just the very beginning. We now have very good evidence that these effects can spill out uh, into the systemic circulation. Um, they can affect probably many systems in the body. And so this is just kind of a complicated graph demonstrating the, some of the underlying biology that links this, um, this or that, that sort of um, uh, underpins this idea. But more generally, I mean, the reason that this is important is really because of this. So you, you, you may have a sense of some of these, but this is a, this is a figure that was produced by a, an organization, um, the Local Lung Association, where, where I live, and I do a lot of work with them. And they produced this figure to kind of summarize what are the known health effects of air pollution? Like what is established? There's very little debate in the scientific community. And what are, what are, what are some of the sort of new effects that we're learning? Well, there's very little doubt. I would say there's, there's clear evidence of a sort of, of a cause and effect relationship between air pollution and shorter life, stroke, heart disease, uh, incident asthma, meaning it causes asthma, lung cancer, air pollution was recently recognized by the um, agency that does this as a, as a known human carcinogen, uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. It reduces lung function and it causes diabetes. So those are the things in red. Now that's bad enough, but there are a whole bunch of other things that the, the preliminary evidence is suggesting are also probably related with air pollution. Cognitive development in children, cognitive decline in adults, mental health. So there are some studies, some, a few studies, some, some very uh, early evidence suggesting that air pollution is associated with anxiety and depression. Uh, obesity in children, uh, birth defects and low birth weight when pregnant women are exposed. So, um, so the point is that you know, air pollution is not just at all, uh, or the effects of air pollution are not at all just localized to the lung. They exist kind of um, throughout the body and collect, can, can, can affect nearly every system in the body. So when you put these two eyes together, ideas together, air pollution causes numerous important health conditions like cardiovascular disease, strokes, heart attacks, um, chronic lung disease, and 95% of the world's population is exposed. When you put those two ideas together, what that means is that there is enormous public health impact. And I think people don't appreciate just how important this hazard is in terms of global health. Um, so I, in my teaching, uh, when I teach students, I use the Global Burden of Disease study a lot. So the Global Burden of Disease study is a really um, a large effort uh, led out of the University of Washington, but involving researchers around the world, where they, they try to understand the number of deaths and the number of diseases that are attributable to different hazards. I like to describe it as quantifying the causes of the causes, right? Nobody dies of air pollution, right? You die of something else. You die of a stroke, you die of a heart attack, but something contributed to you having that heart attack or that stroke, right? So that's what I mean by causes of the causes, the upstream hazards that ultimately increase the risk of disease and ultimately death. And when the global burden of disease people do their work, they look at a whole bunch of different hazards, many of which you're familiar with, obesity, smoking, alcohol, um, you know, intimate partner violence, poor diet, lots of things. They look at all these hazards air pollution ranks right up near the top. Now you can't see this because it's, a, it's a, a tiny little font, but it turns out that when these folks at the Global Burden of Disease Study do this, they estimate among all these hazards that they look at that particulate matter is the sixth leading contributor to the Global Burden of Disease. There are in a given year about five million deaths globally attributed to air pollution, and that accounts for nearly 6% of the Global Burden of Disease, where Global Burden of Disease is defined as kind of death um, or life um, lived at something other than full health. So if you live a certain number of years with a disability, that is considered to be years of healthy life that you have lost or have not achieved. So it's right up near the top of kind of the global um, uh, hazards or, or, or uh, things globally that are impacting public health. Um, 
The Global Burden of Disease Study also puts out a very nice uh, report every year called the State of Global Air. And I put this up here because you might uh, be interested if you're, you know, if you're interested enough to come listen to me talk f about air pollution for an hour, you might be interested to read this report. Um, and they, they, you know, give lots of statistics in terms of trying to understand these causes of the causes, like the fact that air pollution collectively reduces life expectancy by about one year and eight months on average worldwide. More and more and more polluted places, less and less polluted places. They also provide estimates of the, the percentage of different diseases um, that are attributable to air pollution. So, for example, they estimate that something like 20% of all the lung cancer in the world can be attributed to air pollution. Something like 40% of all the COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, you know, so these are, these are major, these are sort of heavy hitters in terms of the things that, that, that make people sick or, or ultimately um, cause people to die. And, you know, a significant fraction of all these can be attributed to air pollution. So that's, that's all bad enough, but the thing that really um, troubles me and the thing that I've gotten more interested in and, and, and some of what we're doing now in, in the UGAR study is focused around this idea of developmental programming. So the idea here is that if we imagine a, a, a pregnant woman who is exposed to something, it, you know, it could be uh, undernutrition, not having enough uh, to eat, it could be stress, it could be some lifestyle hazard, or it could be some environmental exposure like air pollution, that exposure may create a kind of suboptimal prenatal environment, right? The, the prenatal environment is not quite as good as it could be. And in response to that suboptimal pre, prenatal environment, the fetus may undergo some subtle changes to try to adapt to that environment that isn't quite what it should be. But the, 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 the worrisome thing is that there's some evidence that these kind of adaptive changes that the fetus undergoes get kind of locked in. They get programmed, ultimately leading to um, changes in risk of lots of diseases or, or lots of uh, problems in a number of systems in the body, including the re reproductive system, uh, you know, cardiometabolic health, um, and other systems as well. So this is, this is a lot of sort of what we're starting to work on in our, in our UGAR study. Um, and just to sh sort of show this same idea more kind of conceptually, <clears throat> we can sort of imagine in, in sort of simple terms, you can sort of imagine um, that your, your health, your growth and development looks something like this curve, right? Early in life, um, from conception, there is very rapid growth and development. And then depending on what particular you know, system in the body or what health outcome we're talking about, there might be some peak kind of in, 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 uh, in um, early, somewhere between early adulthood and kind of middle age. And then in later life, there's some decline, right? Well, the idea with this sort of, this sort of developmental programming, I mean, one of the reasons that I've gotten really interested in early life exposures is the idea that some, some insult um, from environmental pollution or something else may actually alter what that developmental trajectory looks like, right? So a child who is exposed early in life may never reach his or her full potential, right? And so the blue line is where he or she might have been in terms of their health trajectory over the course of their life, and the red line is where they ended up as a result of this environmental exposure, okay? And so the gray area sort of represents the difference between those, those two, right? So with that all in mind, now I want to tell you a little bit about UGAR. So um, UGAR stands for the Ulaanbaatar Gestation and Air Pollution Research um, Study, um, which uh, we started in 2013-2014. Uh, uh, it's a big effort. Um, it's funded by the Canadian government, uh, but it's got uh, collaborators at a bunch of institutions. My main partners in Mongolia are at the uh, Medical Sciences University, a team led by uh, Dr. Enk Jargal. Um, and we've been here this week uh, with my colleagues doing some training for the next phase of our study. And it really is an extraordinary team that I'm a part of. Um, I really am, I can't tell you how lucky I am to be a part of this uh, really excellent team of, of, uh, of researchers. So the rationale for this, for this work is that there's a bunch of evidence in the scientific literature already when we started this study that air pollution can impair fetal growth. That when pregnant women breathe air pollution, the baby doesn't grow in the same way that, that, that uh, he or she would have um, without that pollution. Now this is a, this is a kind of a, this is a kind of a, um, uh, sort of a researchy slide. But what this shows is a bunch of different studies that have looked at 
uh, exposure in either over the course of a full pregnancy or in different trimesters of pregnancy and looked at the eff effect of birth weight. And so the, the way you read these figures is that in this study, the kind, of, the kind of estimated effect of air pollution on birth weight is this dot. So that would correspond to maybe a loss of 10 grams of birth weight. And then these lines represent kind of how confident they are in that estimate, how precise that estimate is. But if you sort of scan your eye down these different um, these different symbols, you can see that pretty consistently these studies are estimating some negative effect on birth weight. That is, they're pretty consistently estimating that air pollution is making these babies smaller, negatively impairing fetal growth. And so the kind of overall picture when we started this work was that um, air pollution for every 10 micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5 reduces birth weight between, by between 10 and 20 grams. Now that's not a huge reduction, right? Average baby might be 3,500 grams. So 10 to 20 grams isn't a huge reduction, but remember this is an exposure that is everywhere. So this is probably happening to millions if not billions of, of, uh, of, of uh, pregnancies um, around the world. Okay, so with that in mind, we then did, uh, we decided to, to kind of come at this problem from a different perspective, right? These are all what's called observational studies, right? These are all studies where you just, researchers just kind of observe the world as it is. What we decided to try to do was an intervention study, right? So the question is um, not just is air pollution bad for you, but are, can we maybe try to do something about it? So we did a randomized controlled trial where the intervention was portable air purifiers. And these are the, these are the, the air purifiers we use. They're from a, um, a Korean company. Um, there's nothing particularly special about them. They're just like most of the air purifiers that you can buy. Um, and so the intervention group in our study received one or two of these air purifiers, depending how big their apartment was. Uh, the control group received no air purifiers. Our study sample was a group of non-smoking adult pregnant women in UB um, living in apartments, not living in GARES. Um, the reason for that is that we were, well, twofold. Um, we wanted a reliable source of electricity and we thought the electricity would be more reliable in apartments. But the main reason was that we were interested in kind of community level air pollution and we were concerned that if we did a study in GARES, it wouldn't be clear if the signal we were seeing was from the urban air pollution or from that GARES coal stove. So the interpretation got a little, uh, a little, a little murky. So um, we studied apartments and we, um, our initial sample size was 540 women. So the, the study looked like this. Um, so we're, we're interested initially in this period from conception to, to childbirth or delivery. So early in pregnancy, as early as we could, uh, recruit these women, um, what ended up being a median of about 11 weeks into their pregnancy, we went to the intervention homes and deployed the air cleaners, and then we made a bunch of pollution measurements and administered a bunch of questionnaires. We then came back later in pregnancy, made more me measurements, administered more questionnaires, and then when the baby was born, we got, um, we got measurements from the clinic on basically how big the baby was, um, birth weight, head circumference, birth length, those kinds of, of indicators. Um, this is probably too small for you to see, but the idea just show, sort of gives a, a kind of diagram showing how this randomization works. So we start with this population of 540 women, and then we split them into the control or the intervention group. We follow them um, uh, over time, um, and then ultimately analyze uh, the data for the women who um, had a live birth and were still retained in our study. Um, this is what our, our kind of group looks like. So this shows kind of summary statistics for different variables, either in the control group or in the intervention group. And what we're reporting here is the median value, the middle value, as well as the kind of the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile, just to give you a sense of how much it varies. But like you can see that the, the sort of middle value in age was 28, 28 years in the control group, 30 years in the intervention group. Um, um, Pre-pregnancy BMI was 21.7 in the control group, the median, 21.4 in the intervention group, and so on. You know, the, the, the reason people do these intervention uh, or these randomized studies is that you end up with two groups that are quite similar except for the intervention. And that's what you can see here. The two groups are, are quite similar. So it helps you to sort of isolate the effect of the intervention on the outcome. And so there are two things I want to draw your attention to in this figure. One is that, um, you know, smoking rates are pretty high in, in UB. 
so about half of our women reported living with a smoker. Most, the women themselves were, were non-smokers with very few exceptions, uh, but they, many of them lived with a smoker. And the other thing I want to point out is that uh, if you look at the birth weight, the median birth weight uh, was about 100 grams difference between the intervention and the control group. So the intervention group gave birth to babies that had a median birth weight 100 grams higher than the control group. Um, so we'll come back to that in a minute. First question is what did the air cleaners do in terms of exposure, in terms of air pollution? And the answer is they did what we expected them to do. The air cleaners brought down uh, PM 2.5 concentrations by an average of about 29%. Um, so that's kind of what we'd expect, lower concentrations in intervention homes. Um, the, uh, there was quite a bit of seasonal variation. So in the winter, um, when uh, obviously pollution levels are, are high um, and it's colder, so win windows may be uh, sealed more often. The uh, air purifier brought down PM 2.5 concentrations by about 36%. Similar in the spring and the fall, a little bit lower, quite a lot lower in the summer. And that's probably due to the fact that air cleaners are less effective when the, there's more air being exchanged and, and when windows are open more. It's also probably just due to the fact that in the summer, people here aren't as concerned about air pollution. So you're not gonna run the air purifier a, as often. Um, and we heard that from some of our participants, just kind of anecdotally. We also found that the air uh, purifiers or use of the air purifiers kind of petered out over time. So when we first deployed them, the first week after we deployed them, they were bringing down pollution levels by an average of about 40%. Five months later, when we went back and made additional measurements, they were only bringing down levels by about 15%. Now, this is probably two things going on. One is that the air purifiers may be becoming less effective. We didn't change the filters, so it was the same filter throughout. The other thing, though, that we heard that I just alluded to a minute ago is that some participants indicated that they got sick of, the, they got sick of it. They got sick of the noise. They were concerned about electricity costs, so they just turned it off, right? So it's probably both of those things going on in terms of why it was less effective over time. Okay, so now I want to share some health results with you, but I, before I get to the kind of main results that we were uh, expecting to look at, I'm going to show you two very surprising results, um, and these become important for interpreting the rest of what I'm going to tell you about. So we found that the intervention was associated with a lower risk of spontaneous abortion. So this is pregnancy loss in the first 20 weeks of pregnancy. So what I'm presenting here is called an odds ratio. Odds ratio. This is an epidemiologic term that is basically just an estimate of the difference in risk between one group and another. So in other words, the way you can interpret that number of 0 0.38, it means that the risk was about 38% the risk in the intervention group was about 38% of what it is in the control group, right? So, so lower risk in the intervention group, suggesting that the air cleaner is reducing the risk of spontaneous abortion. We also found that the air cleaner appeared to be associated with a higher risk of preterm birth. Now, uh, we th we've thought a lot about this. We've talked to a lot of people about this. We don't think there's any plausible way that an air purifier can increase the risk of preterm birth. We think what's going on is that these two outcomes are actually related to each other. And this is how we described it when we published these results. The presence of the intervention may have enabled fetuses to survive long enough to be born preterm. So in other words, the, the speculation is that the reason it looks like there's more preterm birth in the intervention group is that fetuses that may have otherwise been lost were kept alive long enough that instead of resulting in a spontaneous abortion, they actually resulted in a preterm birth, okay? So that's kind of an important little nuance. Okay, so, um, so now moving on to the, to the birth weight um, results. This doesn't kind of reproduce very well, but what this figure is meant to show is kind of the distribution of birth weight in the intervention in the control group. Kind of ignore the bars, but if you can just make out these two uh, kind of uh, little mountainous shaped curves, you may be able to see that the birth weight uh, curve or the birth weight distribution in the intervention group is shifted to the right. What that means is that, the, is that the average birth weight in the intervention group is shifted to the right, okay? So after accounting for those differences in preterm birth, we estimated that the intervention was associated with, with an increase in mean or average birth weight of about 84 grams, okay? So on average, women in the intervention group are giving birth to babies who weigh 84 grams more than women in the control group, okay? So does this matter? One of the questions we wanted to ask ourselves was, do we care about an 84 gram difference in birth weight? 
Well, one of the ways we thought about it is, well, let's compare our estimated effect, the estimated effect of our intervention with some other interventions that are designed to improve fetal growth, okay? So remember our estimate, 84 grams. This is what we're estimating in our study. In studies that look at uh, interventions focused on maternal nutrition, right? So, so uh, lots of international organizations really pretty aggressively promote some of these interventions to try to improve maternal nutrition so that fetal growth will be improved. These, these studies estimate that the effect of these maternal nutrition interventions um, are around 50 grams in high income countries where the baseline birth weight is higher and around 94 grams in low income countries where the baseline birth weight is lower. So the, the point here is that is our effect, the effect we're estimating, is it big or small? Well, I don't know, but it's at least as big, it appears to be at least as big as the effect you get from um, improving maternal nutrition. Okay. Um, all right, I wanna finish up with a couple of kind of preliminary results from the next phase of our study. So we were funded by the Canadian government to actually continue observing this cohort of kids, right? So the original study was just focused on fetal growth, but we were given some additional funding to continue to follow this cohort over time and look at some different outcomes as these kids um, kind of grow and develop. And these are preliminary, these haven't been um, um, published yet. This is work by some students that, that worked with me. Um, uh, so these are, these are preliminary, but I, but I think they're kind of interesting. One of the things we looked at was, was just parent reported symptoms in the first, in this case, in the first year of life. So we just asked mom or dad, you know, has your child ha experienced any of these, um, you know, at sort of regular inter intervals. And what we found was that the reporting of wheeze, which is when you get kind of a whistling sound in your chest when you try to breathe, um, and, and can be a, a sort of an early indicator that a child might be kind of uh, at risk of developing asthma later in life, the reporting in the intervention group was about half as much as the reporting in the control group. So maybe there's something going on with the intervention there. And the, and the key idea here is that the intervention was in place during pregnancy, right? So any effects we see from the intervention are not the result of, of exposure in childhood, they're actually the result of exposure to mom during pregnancy. And that's, that's I think, a, an important distinction. So the other thing that we um, uh, have, have analyzed so far, we have lots of data, much of it we haven't even had a chance to look at yet, uh, but another thing that we have looked at is height and weight. So we measured the children's height and we measured their weight when they were two years of age, and then we calculated um, body mass index. Many of you have probably heard of body mass index. It's a measure of weight relative to height, right? So taller people tend to weigh more. So in order to kind of account for that, you calculate this body mass index. And we found that children born to women in the intervention group um, had a lower body mass index, a small but, but measurable uh, difference in body mass index between the two groups at age two. Now that's probably not an important difference, but it does, again, potentially suggest that these two groups of kids are on different developmental trajectories. The last thing I wanna tell you about is we looked at this another way. Instead of just looking at body mass index, we looked at something called catch-up growth. So there's some evidence in the scientific literature that, that body mass index itself isn't all that important, but that this catch-up growth is a really strong predictor of adverse or, or poor uh, cardio cardiovascular and metabolic health later in life. So what catch-up growth refers to is, if you imagine that the vertical axis here is kind of size, right, and the, and the, and the horizontal axis is age, right? So the, the origin here, the zero, zero point is when a child's born. Right? So this represents sort of a hypothetical growth curve. It wouldn't really be a straight line, but let's assume it's a straight line. This is a growth curve for a kid, right? So they're born at that size, and then as they get older, they grow, right? That's what all human beings do. Um, but what catch-up growth refers to is a child who is born small and then experiences catch-up growth. You can see where the name comes from. They grow at a more rapid rate. It's like their body's trying to sort of overcome being born small and catch up to their peers, right? But the problem is they tend to overshoot the mark, right? They tend to, they tend to ultimately often have a higher uh, body mass index, higher risk of, of being overweight uh, or obesity. So they're, they're born smaller, but they gain weight rapidly and they kind of overshoot the normal growth trajectory. So we looked in our study, we looked at catch-up growth. We looked at differences between the intervention and control group of kids who were born small and then ended up big. And specifically what we looked at is whether a kid was below the median birth weight 
but at age two was above the median body mass index. It's like they've switched sides. They were on the bottom half, and then by age two, they're on the top half. And we found that the intervention seemed to reduce the risk of this catch-up growth. So again, I'm reporting this odds ratio, which is like a ratio of the risks. So essentially, the way you can interpret that, interpret that bottom number of 0.49 is that the risk of this catch-up growth was, was about half as big in the intervention group as it was in the control group. So these are very preliminary results, and you know the kids are only two years of age. But again, it does suggest uh, results that are kind of um, consistent with this developmental programming hypothesis that what happens in the prenatal environment actually makes changes that linger and may put these kids on different developmental trajectories. Um, so we have lots of, of work that's ongoing. We're evaluating a lot of different health effects. We've been measuring cognitive development in these kids, essentially IQ in these kids over the last couple of years. We're administering questionnaires about behavior and social development. I'm here with some colleagues this week to actually train our team in how to do measurements of lung function. Uh, we're measuring blood pressure and lots of other outcomes. Um, so we really have a, a kind of a unique opportunity to really understand the effect of early life exposure to air pollution on a number of systems in the body. So let me just summarize and then I'll, I'll stop talking. Um, so there's considerable evidence from observational studies that air pollution exposure during pregnancy affects birth weight, affects fetal growth. Uh, we found, and that's really what, what motivated our original study, we found that portable air purifiers reduced indoor PM2.5 concentrations by about 29% in UB on average. And remember, PM2.5 is really arguably the most health relevant pollutant. Our results suggest that air purifier use improves fetal growth. Um, and as I said, the effect that we estimated is actually comparable to, to efforts to improve maternal nutrition. And then finally, um, the, our preliminary results are consistent with this idea that prenatal exposure, exposure during pregnancy, may actually continue to affect childhood development after birth. So um, I just want to acknowledge, first and foremost, the, the participants and the families in the UGAR study who have continued to work with us and continue to, to um, uh, welcome us into their homes and, and, and allow us to um, learn a lot about them. The UGAR staff, who is just incredibly dedicated and hardworking, and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, who has um, funded uh, really all of this um, work. So I will stop there. Uh, happy to take questions or comments. I also put my email address up here, so if you don't want to ask a question or make a comment now, but you think of one later, please, uh, by all means, f uh, feel free to email me. Thank you very much. Thank you.